So let me just, uh, is this on? Yeah. So we're just wondering if we, uh, we probably can finish if we move pretty fast uh, by tomorrow. And so the question is, should we have, if any of you are interested in discussing this stuff or going over through anything in more detail or anything, we have a little room after the lecture tomorrow, or we could do it Thursday at the official time, uh, which is not on the slide, but that would be less convenient for John. But so we don't want to ask you because we know you'll just sit there. So if you uh, get moved to express an interest in any of that, let us, let me or, let us or Emily or somebody know. So the plan is, to the extent that there's a plan, I'm going to go as far as I can go and get to the end of the Lambda stuff, and then John will um, uh, talk for about half a lecture on the mathematical modeling, um, which a different subset of the audience will understand. And then I'll come back and just say a few words about the extension of the Lambda ideas to regulatory systems in general, as argued in the book Genes and Signals. Speaking of which, all of the uh, slides that I sh figures if you don't want to buy the book, are at that website. And also, uh, a couple years ago, I did a whole series of lectures like this one on genes and signals, and that's on that website. Uh, the books are in the bookstore. Do you know that Rockefeller has a bookstore? Very few people know this. And uh, Emily gave me directions on how to get there. <laughs> and so, uh, that doesn't work, you can always um, go to Amazon or to one of those places. So we ended up here, and now we're about to embark on chapter four, the how do we know chapter. And there's always a question how much of this. So the, the spirit will be, as before, that a lot of this will go by very fast, and the idea is that you know the general point, you know the argument is there, and if you want to look it up, you can, so I just give you the idea. Um, the claims are, of this bit of it are something like repressor is a monomer that dimerizes and binds cooperatively. The dimers bind cooperatively to two sites in the operator, the right operator. Those repressors turn transcription to the right off and transcription to the left on. Since the gene to the left is repressor, it maintains its own synthesis in lysogen after having been established from a different promoter. If repressive concentration rises, it binds to site three and turns itself off, so there's both autogenous positive and negative control. This whole thing is astoundingly stable, but then by eliminating cooperativity functions uh, can be induced with a very high efficiency. So how do we know all that is true? So in describe, oh, and let me just remind you that you just gotta remember this. This promoter going to the left is called PRM for repressor maintenance. It maintains itself on. PR is for promoter to the right. Those are lytic genes which are kept off by the repressor. So this autoregulatory system here is right at the heart of the switch and the, the epigenetic switch and so on. The morals, I was trying to think of this morning. Why, why would anyone care? The morals go like this, at least some of them. All aspects of the picture are important. We, we, we're trying to find a coherent explanation and it's in terms of the structures of the molecules. So. Not every fact matters, but every aspect of the picture. I think you'll see what I mean. In case you're wondering why we go into this, that, and so on. No single finding stands on its own. So every finding will make a prediction that will either be confirmed or denied by some other experiment or by in vivo, in vitro, so on and so forth. There's no privileged approach. Now, I don't know if you have this problem, but I've always had the problem of people, of chauvinists. They'll tell you the only way to truth is genetics, or the only way to truth is crystallography or so on and so forth. And of course, it's not true. There is no way. There is a picture, but there's no privileged way to get there. And, re and so far, reductionism has been the way, as I pointed out before. You'll see that in detail, and this should inspire the physicists and so on to create a new way of doing these sorts of things. Which I think is great. I think you're in for great disillusionment. By the way, were you the one who asked me about the 
one base pair thing? No, not you. Somebody asked me. He's not here. You did. Yeah. The answer is <laughs> the experiment's never been done. I, I asked the, the source of all knowledge, Anne Hochschild, and she said, ah, I never got that experiment done. I might mention some names as we go along, because some of these names will be familiar to you in, in quite other contexts. You might be surprised to learn the early work they did. So here is mainly a series of in vitro experiments. So every picture that we have uh, has, in chapter four, arguments. So for example, the repressor comprises two domains with a linker of some 40 amino acids. How do we know that's true? Well, if you isolate repressor, there are two kinds of experiments you can do early. One is proteolysis, and the other is something fancy called scanning calorimetry. If you chop it up with a protease, you end up with two solid domains, stable domains, one of which you can show by sequences from the carboxyl domain, and there's one is from the amino domain. So that's by definition two domains. But it's even more fun than that because if you put the protein in a scanning calorimeter, this is something I've never heard of it before and I've never heard of it since Carl Pabo and Bob Sauer, but I think primarily Carl uh, did this. Um, uh, you, you heat up the protein and as when it denatures, boom, it absorbs heat. So you can check the denaturation of various bits of the protein. And what's unusual about repressor is that the two domains yeah. really do, um, really do um, denature independently. They don't influence one another. Most multidomain proteins are not really so, as it were, separate. See what I mean? Then if you separate the domains, you get these two separate denaturations. So it's really quite a striking <laughs> example of a two domain protein. The next claim is that repressor dimerizes and that the contacts are mediated primarily by the carboxyl domain, so like this. Well, we know that because, first of all, exper early experiments, Vince Perota played an important role in these early experiments. You may know him of Drosophila fame now. And Nancy Hopkins, of course, for a lot of reasons famous now, did the, was important in the initial isolation of stuff. So um, if you sediment, you know, to a first approximation, if you do velocity sedimentation, that is, you watch how fast something go through a sucrose gradient, you can estimate its size. It's, you'll see that this can, well, it's not so straightforward, but in the old days, there's still a, a way to do it. So if you do this at low concentration, you get things that, if you take a marker, fits with a monomer of exactly, of, of the molecular weight of a monomer. It's only uh, tricky because it depends on both the size and the shape of the protein. But anyway, you get a monomer. You raise concentration, the whole peak moves over, and you deduce that the, it's mostly dimer. Now, you can be fooled, but but certainly the sedimentation. Um, and at very high concentration, maybe there were tetramers. And then, since you know, um, since you can watch the formation of the larger species as a function of concentration, you can right away estimate a dissociation constant. And from the dissociation constant of monomers to dimers, you infer that this is an unstable, that this is a real equilibrium situation. And in the cell, where the concentration is 100 nanomolar, and since the dissociation constant is 10 to the minus eighth molar, about 90% of the protein is dimer if it's free in solution. This gets a little complicated because there's no such thing as proteins free in solution, as John will tell you, but that's the sort of thing. So it's not like, say, if you know what I mean, lac repressor, it's not like you have a stable gizmo. You have this thing that's coming and going. And by the way, in the gradient, you see that it's, if you isolate the carboxyl domains, they make these dimers and tetramers, the amino domains do not. So it's clear that the major force for oligomerization comes from the carboxyl domains. How do we know that a dimer binds a 17 base pair site? Well, let's see. Now this I want to do very quickly because it'll, OK. First, there's a kind of equilibrium analysis. What you do is you measure the affinity of the protein for the binding of the protein to the DNA by putting it through a nitrocellulose filter. The protein sticks to the filter, and if the DNA is labeled, it sticks. So you measure the P32 on the filter. There may be better ways to do this now. I'm not sure, because this was pretty good. So you, 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 you fix it so you're at equilibrium. The, the repressor is in excess, and it's coming on and off. And you, now you put it through the filter, and you're taking a snapshot of how many of these operators are bound. You can, from that, get a binding curve, which shows you the binding of repressor as a function of concentration. And look what happens. Instead of looking like a michaelis metten I guess that's called, curve, you get something that's sigmoid. Looks like oxygen binding to hemoglobin. 
Now, when you see a sigmoid curve, your problems have only begun because there are two general explanations for a sigmoid curve. One is that, for example, monomers are making dimers, for example, something interesting. The other is that you're just inactivating the protein at low concentration. Maybe it hits the filter and it gets inactivated. You never know what a sigmoid curve means until you do something else. Maybe you never know, but you can at least argue about it. So, it turns out that, that this kind of sigmoidicity is not restricted to, these, to this um, filter binding kind of thing as the subunit rescue experiment shows. In this case, you mix label lambda repressor with DNA and run it down a gradient and it sticks to the DNA. Now the amusing thing is that if you have the DNA, the label lambda repressor alone, it binds very little. Then if you dilute it with unlabeled repressor counterintuitively, the amount it bound goes up. Instead of diluting it, you're actually increasing its binding. Right? So you're driving it into a DNA binding form. So you're rescuing these subunits. Now, I'm not, now that's specific. That happens with lambdas helping lambdas and 434s helping 434s. They don't help each other. Non-specific protein doesn't work. So, so that's good. Then there's an amazing result called the, oh, wait a minute. I thought I had changed this. I didn't. Okay, this is called the subunit rescue experiment. The subunit, no, no, I'm sorry. This is called the order of addition experiment. Order of addition. So here's what happens. You take repressor in a tube and it's got a certain concentration. Now you can measure its DNA binding in this filter binding assay in two ways. One way is to put it into a larger volume and then add the DNA. Or you can add the DNA first and just add it right to the DNA. And the amazing thing is that you get the same amount of binding if you wait a while, but at early times, you, you get a lot of binding if the DNA is already there. You get little binding if the DNA comes second, and then slowly it binds. So the explanation is that you're adding the DNA binding form, which is a dimer. It has a quick tendency. At low concentration, it falls apart. If, on the other hand, there's DNA present, and, and now it has to slowly make dimers to hop on the DNA. If, on the other hand, it sees DNA, boom, it binds very quickly. And in fact, one of the characteristics of these proteins is that they bind tremendously quickly and with high affinity. But this was, <laughs> always amazed by this experiment. So then, you can ask, well, this fast binding stuff, if you increase the concentration, the more concentration you have to start with, the more dimers you'll have, and in fact, it should go as the square of the concentration of the protein, and that's true. So without going through it, you can see in the thing, you do this and you get a slope of two. If you plot the log of the repressor versus the initial rates. And then if you go back to the sigmoid curve and you plot this versus this and you so on and so forth, you just look at the, you assume that the thing makes a dimer. The dimer binds to the operator, so the overall reaction is an equilibrium constant that goes by the square of the repressor concentration. So then just make a rearrangement and the log of the bound stuff over the free will have a slope of two if you plot it against the free repressor. And in fact, that's two, true. So everything seems to say that the binding form is a dimer and that the dimer dissociates into monomers and the dimer forms as the square of the concentration of the monomer. Those were our heady days of physical chemistry. Um, right, that was Vince Perota and uh, Paul, a guy named Paul Chadwick. So, so how do we know the amino domains content? Yeah. Um, did you have, did you have to redo this experiment? Did you choose to do this or did you do it just because you wanted to do it? Did you uh, Well, the Hope and Struhl experiment requires that you have a header dimer, right? And you have Oh, I see. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's better. Uh, that's better. If you suspect it's a dimer, right. <laughs> I, I imagine that's better. So if you don't know what she means, there's a very nice thing invented by Gary, uh, Kevin Struhl. Is it Hope and Struhl? I don't remember. But anyway, uh, but, but I'm sorry. Uh, we could discuss it later if you want. I just won't. So there are 
There are other ways to do these things. But as a matter of fact, the, the stuff I just told you about was, um, I mean, there was, as it were, I hate to use the word, discoveries. I mean, who knew that when you would put it in, you would, it, that just, whether you get this dissociation effect, and the, to, that just depends on how quickly it falls apart, and how quickly it binds, and you might see that, you might not. I mean, certainly wouldn't see it with lactopressin. which is a stable tetramer. OK, so how do we know the amino domains contact DNA? Well, <coughs> uh, this is the picture. The carboxyl domains are dimerized, and we already know that. So this is just this plain old thing called uh, in vitro footprinting, which maybe everybody knows. You have a, label, a DNA molecule with label at the end, and now you cut it with DNAase, and you get ladders in a gel, a ladder in a gel. If the protein is sitting there, the DNAase can't cut, and you get a hole in the middle. Um, now, uh, I was trying to think, actually, is there an easier way to do this now with PCR or something? I don't know. Footprinting is still, still pretty good stuff. Um, and so, if you do that, and you, you, you get a footprint, so what you would do is you take repressor and you get a footprint right over a 17 base pair site. Now, amazingly enough, if you add just the amino domains, you get exactly the same footprint. It's just that it takes a lot more repressor because they can't dimerize. Right? So there's, they, they bind more weakly. But they never bind independently. They still, there's still enough of an interaction of the amino domains with each other that you get. But it's quite clear that it's the amino domains that are doing the binding. And in fact, so here's where I'm breaking the rule and going in vivo, but this is an important early observation. If you take just the amino domain of repressor and you overproduce it in a cell, the cell's immune to lambdas, not to 434s. So right away, you see, the whole world is going to depend on concentration of these things. Because the only difference between the amino domain and the intact repressor is that the intact repressor makes dimers and hence can bind at a lower concentration than the amino domains. Right, like I, like I keep saying, this is why molecular biology is or should be hard. Is that clear what I'm talking about? Ah, now, I, I don't know, this, I'll just say, I didn't, um, for some reason this is not clearly laid out in the book. In fact, I was reminded, because this first discovery that the operator contained reiterated sites was actually Tom Maniatis, who some of you know in many other contexts. He took labeled, infinitely hotly labeled P32 so that the rest of us were scared to be in the lab. And he would then add more and more repressor and he would get protected pieces that were larger and larger. And it, it was a bit confusing without going into the details, but then it turned out that when Keith Backman, another guy in the lab, inspected the sequences when they finally came around sequencing in some old-fashioned way, he picked out these 17 base pair sites, and indeed when then, when the footprinting was done, and when I say footprinting, the guy who did this was uh, a postdoc named Zafir Humayan, and if you looked in the, around the lab bench, you, with a Geiger counter, you could see footprints of P32, so <laughs> this was a very serious thing. So you, you then saw that repressor would indeed protect these three things, so it became to be. Now, of course, there's always the problem that you don't know what it means if you just see that sort of thing. So uh, let's just say, because this gets, you, you can isolate mutants, and we had mutants even back then, all through OR1, all through OR2, all through OR3, and they all affected repressor binding to each site, as you'll see in a minute, in a particular way. Very important is this mutant UP1, which is a mutation that uh, makes PRM a strong promoter. Remember, PRM is a weak promoter, needs help. If you change a single base pair, it becomes more like PR and it works on its own. This 116 is a down mutation. So, now we get into something really fun. This was this whole, well, this astounding series of things that Sandy Johnson and Barbara Meyer did. So here we go again with the footprinting, but now we're going to look at an intact operator <laughs> and ask how much, see, you can do this now, uh, or Sandy could do it, where you, you have the repressor and the DNA at such a concentration that it's at equilibrium. That means you're not just adding repressor and it's not just binding, it's actually coming on and off an equilibrium. You have to fool, but you get the right concentrate. So then you say, well, how much repressor do I need to fill this site compared to this site or this site? 
And the answer is 25-fold to one-to-one, one, roughly. So in other words, sites one and two first fill, and then with a dissociation constant of 10 or 20 times higher, you fill the third site. So that's fine. You don't know what to make of that. But if you now mutate each site, say two sites, or one and or three, and you ask, what's the affinity to site two? Or what's the affinity to site one by knocking out two and three? So you're looking at the intrinsic affinity, right, of each site. The amazing answer is that sites, that site uh, two and three are equal and are very low compared, I mean low compared to site one. Site one has gone down slightly. So the interpretation is that one and two are binding cooperatively. Site 3 is not, right? And the effect is mostly of a repressor binding to the strong site helping binding to the weak site, but inevitably there's some help the other way, which is this factor of 2. Is that clear? Um, and, <laughs> and the other way to measure the intrinsic affinities is to, the ratio of intrinsic affinities, I should say, is to use just the amino domains. And they bind non-cooperatively. So, so the cooperative function, which enables OR1 to help OR2, is, found, is because of the, the carboxyl domain and because of those interactions. Now, um, right, I, I don't have to, well, I've done the park bench thing about cooperativity, so keep that in mind. That's, that's all we're talking about. Now, it turns out, this is not just, as you'll see in a moment, this was a seminal thing here that I'm about to just mention. I've already told you about alternate pairwise cooperativity, but it turns out this really is an important thing. So you remember that, that the, the idea is that repressor bound to site one helps one bind to site two, but not to site three because it's clear from this picture that it can lean to the right, but it can't lean to the left. And I guess I don't have the picture that says that if you knock out site one, of course, then they can lean and touch. So site two and site three can now bind cooperatively. That's a mutant situation, but one calls that alternate pairwise cooperativity. And just to, uh, John will mention this, that's one of the, I mean, that's a possible state of the system where you could have them bound cooperatively two and three. It's just much rarer than the state where it's bound to one and two. So now, what happens? So here's what you find, that if you knock out site one, now sites two and three bind at the same affinity, just as they're, they're, same, they're the same as each other, but notice that they are fivefold tighter than with the, with the wild type operator. In other words, now a guy at site two can help a guy at site three. Right, so you get cooperativity either to one and two or to two and three. And that cooperative, this is kind of, you might put it this way, it's kind of like action at a distance. At a certain repressor concentration, one and two will be filled, but site three will not. Now you mutate site one, and at that same repressor concentration, site three is filled, which is great, <laughs> right? You can imagine the hysteria that you could get into if you wanted to make life complicated. I guess one of the other morals is, don't be disillusioned if the answer is simple. Yeah? There's no promoter here at all, yeah. This is all done in vitro with purified repressor on just right. So you could imagine, you could write many things about telestability and DNA and whoop, whoop, because it is a kind of action at a distance. Yeah. No, one and three do not detectably bind cooperatively. And the explanation is, whether the explanation is that it's just too far to reach. And in fact, by the time you get to three, you're on the other side of the helix. So you've got an even farther thing to reach. I suppose you could ask the question, what if you made a longer and longer linker? <sighs> and could you finally get cooperativity to OR1 and OR3? I think what what uh, we found, 
uh, as you make the change the linker, the ideal. to talk about these two alternate paths, right? I don't think we know. There could be a small number of tetramers. You'd have to know a lot. You'd have to know really what is the concentration of pre-existing tetramers in that, at that concentration of repressor, I think, right? And I don't, don't think we know. And so it's perfectly fine to say that the path is one binds and then that just stay, then another, you know, it's coming on and off, but it's just held there by the second one coming on. But people are always telling me that you can't distinguish paths from equilibrium anyway, so I, I, I don't know. Is there, is there a better answer to this question? Uh, so all of the paths can exist, but because of the concentration of the so maybe a dominant path. Yeah, okay. Right, good. That's the answer. That's a good answer. So for those of you who didn't on the film, <laughs> there can be lots of paths, but because of the particular concentrations and of things and, and binding constants, so on one path can, can predominate. And in answer to Tish's question, I think the likeliest path here is that the dimers are binding independently and stabilizing each other, as opposed to having a preformed tetramer. Mm -hmm. But I don't think one really, really knows. So now you do all this again with Crow, and you find that it binds non-cooperatively, as you know, and it binds, first it fills site three, then you see it binding to site three and site two, or site three and site one and then filling all three sites. Look, the footprint looks exactly like repressor, it's just in the opposite order without the cooperativity. So we don't have to go through that. Okay, in vivo. So far, I've mostly just talked about in vitro experiments, so why believe any of it? It's just blah, blah. Could have started with the in vivo, and you didn't have to believe that either. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but these rather astonishing experiments are largely the work of Barbara Meyer, regulation of worms um, with help from someone named Russ Moyer. So here's the idea. How are you ever going to figure out how this system works where you've got all, these, all this feedback, you've got cooperativity, multiple sites, two promoters, blah, blah, blah. So I suppose if one of you guys there would get a computer and try to figure it out. But what us straightforward type guys do is to try to completely reduce the system to its elementary parts. So the way you do that is you nail a repressor to a single site and you ask what effect does it have? Now how do you do that in vivo? Well, in this situation, there's a construct where lack repressor is turning off the repressor gene. Now you have a reporter where PRM is attached to lack Z, a product of which you can easily assay, right? So now you add IPTG, which is the inducer of the lack operon, so that the repressor gets inactivated. The more IPTG you add, the more repressor is made. Now you can look at the effect of repressor binding over a range of concentrations at OR on the, on the expression of PRM by looking at the beta-galactosidase produced. It's kind of fun because it's, it's just like this, the world, way the world works. You add IPTG or lactose and you make beta-galactosidase. Well, same thing here. It's just that there's this regulatory thing in between. Okay, so, so, that, so then you, you, you can see the effect of repressor on PRM. Now you can turn this reporter around so that PR is reading LAXE. They're both facing this direction just as a convention. Of course, PRM goes that way. But, and so you can ask for the effect of repressor. So what you do now, for example, you take a, a, a reporter that has OR1 knocked out and OR3 knocked out with multiple mutations. Now you start adding repressor, and you say, well, the only effect of repressor is going to be when it's bound to OR2, right? So here's what happens. You, you do one tube, you're doing PRM, and the other tube, you're doing PR. So as you add repressor, it starts to bind to site 2, and then it fills up site 2. PR goes down, PRM goes up. So repressor at site 2 simultaneously turns off PR as it turns on PRM, just like I told you before, 
in the first chapter. What happens to, what does a repressor at site one do? Well, same experiment. You knock out now these other two sites. You add repressor and sure enough, it turns off PR as it binds. It has no effect on PRN. What happens to a repressor, what does a repressor at site three do? It has no effect on anybody in this experiment. Now, it, it, it might have turned off the basal level of PRM, just if you're following this carefully, but we didn't measure that in those days. So it was just no effect. But you put these things together. Ah, I must have left out the, uh, hit the wrong. Hmm. Well, I was just going to show you, what's, you can look at it. It, it. The truth table is, um, shows you that a repressor at site one turns off PR, has no effect on PRM. Site two turns on PR. M turns off PR. Site three turns off PRM. But that's just what I've just told you. So anyway, you end up with then this picture. So now this integrates a huge amount of stuff, right? It tells you we know repressor binds cooperatively to sites one and two. We know repressor alone will turn this on. Repressor here will turn this off. We know the amino domains are binding to DNA. We know the carboxyl DNA guys are binding cooperatively. And so this is what it looks like in a lysogen. At higher concentrations, the repressor would bind to site 3 and turn off PRM. Now, I said before that the alternate pairwise cooperativity was important. Because, oh, so let, let me just show you, by the way, if you take a, just an ordinary wild type template, and now you ask what happens as you add more and more repressor, um, you, you see that PR gets turned off, as PRM gets turned on, and then PRM gets turned off again as site 3 is filled. So repressor activates and then represses. If you had mutated site 3, it would activate and not turn off. But if you had mutated either any of these sites, you see it would not have worked this way. So the, I said before that alternate pairwise cooperativity was a good thing. And remember that mutation that made PRM work more strongly, PRM up one, that's this guy right here. So that means that in the absence of repressor, the thing is working at a pretty high level. And now the, this, quite telling result. So now this is with PRM up one, and you see there's a high basal level when there's no, no repressor. Now you knock out site one and you add repressor, and now you see PRM gets turned off at the same time as PR gets turned off. It doesn't happen at higher concentrations because now sites two and three are binding cooperatively. It's exactly what you'd predict from the alternate cooperativity result that was seen in vitro plus everything else I've said. Whew, is that clear? It just struck me today how, what a powerful result this is because this makes an outlandish prediction that if you mutate site one, you will now bind to site three and two in vivo simultaneously and you'll repress PRM as you repress PR and you won't, you'll never activate PRM. And that's exactly what happens. So, that's good stuff. Ah, there it is, there's the truth table. It shows you what happens when the repressor bound at each site, but there it is again. <laughs> okay. It's not clear that, that, that actually the molecules are actually blue. In the initial edition they were red, so something to keep in mind. So now you rem remember that what happens with Crow, the first th protein that's made when induction happens, Crow binds to site 3 and then binds to these other sites and turns itself down. And so you just repeat everything I just said with Crow instead of repressor. So you make Crow, whoops, you repeat this except that there's Crow here. So you ask what's the effect of Crow on PR and PRM and the simple answer is that on PRM up 1 you see PRM gets repressed earlier than PR because it binds to site 3 before it binds to sites 1 and 2. And you never get any activation, you simply get this repression. So 
it's that combination of in vitro and in vivo that that gives you that thing. So, uh, yes, I think I'm now going to go on to something slightly differently. It's different as there. So if you have any problems with this, let me know. Okay, another claim that we made was that, you see, in those days, we didn't know how DNA, this was a big argument, right? See, but part of the whole picture is going to include the question of how proteins bind DNA and therefore how they activate or repress genes. And you'll remember I said, I made as a claim in chapter one that repressor doesn't change the, the uh, pitch of the helix, or if it does, it's not relevant to anything. And in fact, the way it works is an alpha helix fits in the major groove and just makes contacts in that groove. So the recognition helix is the claim, is the second helix in the helix turn helix motif. So this recognition helix, which is bisymmetrically by uh, twofold symmetrically displayed here, um, is making contacts with guys, and that's the main source of, of specificity. Showing that um, uh, is this thing called the helix swap experiment. So this Robin Wharton did this, another Drosophila person now. So this is P22, this is 434. P22 is another repressor like lambda, and if you look at its helix, Three. It is um, uh, there's an outside and an inside. The outside has these guys, and the inside has these hydrophobics that enable the thing to pack against the body of the protein. If you change the whole helix, you destroy the protein. But if you change just the guys on the outside, the prediction is you change the specificity of the protein. And so that's what was done: is to take these. Let's see, how was it done? to take these outside guys and put them onto the 434 repressor, right? And so now this thing, this hybrid with a helix swap is immune, recognizes the P22 operator and makes cells immune to phage P22, even though it's all 434 except for these residues right here. Now, of course, it doesn't always work this simply. Remember, lambda had an arm, and that would confuse things which these guys don't have, and there are always some contacts from elsewhere, but this made the basic and makes the basic point that a recognition helix fitting in the alpha, in the major groove can determine specificity. Yes, and I just told you that. This is still another <laughs> reminiscent of a Struhl type experiment. You could make a, you, 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 you can take this and mix it with this and now you get a certain percentage of the guys who will recognize a hybrid operator, <laughs> which is kind of cute. So that shows that there are two of these. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, Deep D. Jane, I don't know if she's here, but she gave me this. Uh, she's in Seth's lab, gave me this last night, and just shows you the crystal structure of the alpha helix lying in the major groove. And so that's very nice. I don't know why there's no arm on this one, but there you are. Okay. The mechanism of activation. That is the most fraught of all subjects. And so now we're going to go right on to what is new, which some of you will be thrilled to know. We're finally getting to. Okay, so uh, we want to view show. All right. So now, we're on to this new chapter, chapter five, called, with great imagination, New Developments. Um, there were, you know, this is a funny thing to say, but there are two mysteries in the old description. But of course, nobody knew they were mysteries. You never know, I mean, it, it, um, you, you never know whether there's something, if you can't explain it, with real clarity, you don't know if it's something to worry about or not, because it might just be a thing. There are always things, right? So, uh, the scandal is, I, if I may say, that the systems biologists didn't figure this out. <laughs> because if ever there were a case where you'd think. So, um, yes. <laughs> 
So why? So the, it, it's only in re, when you. Here's the thing, the thing. When the answer was figured out, then we knew there was a mystery. Up till then, we had explained this. <laughs> Fantastic explanations for this, but they're complete nonsense. So um, here's the thing. You remember that there's a right operator, and then 2,000 base pairs away, there's a left operator. And in between is the repressor gene. Now, we've, gone, we've are, said to death what these three sites in OR are doing. So two of them are from the right to the left and blah, blah, blah. But here you have just one promoter, a lytic promoter going to the left and repressor binding to site OL1 and OL2 turns them off, just like repressor binding to OL1 and OL2 turns that off. So why is there an OL3? Okay, so that was mystery number one. Mystery number two, which we were Also, uh, we were perfectly cognizant of, but didn't know if it was a problem. Why is autogenous negative control of C1 so inefficient? So you remember I showed you this, that as you add repressor, PRM gets turned off. But if you were to quantitate this, you'd find out that to, to get down here, you need like 10 times more repressor than is in a lysogen. And that in a lysogen itself, the repressor, and in fact, I think I'm about to show you this, it, uh, repressor was only, self-regulating itself at something like the 10% of the time, and it just, or even less. So it seemed like such a wussy thing. But then you throw up your hands and say, well, you know, someday somebody will do a calculation and show that it's reasonable, because you, you just don't know. But it turns out that, that these, both of these things come together in the most amazing way. And it turns out that it involves cooperativity, not just between OR1 and OR2, and OL1 and OL2, which I didn't mention, but between OL1, LOL2, OR1, and OR2, they make a octomer. There's a long-range cooperativity effect, and that explains both of these mysteries in a most astonishing way. So here's the old picture. Here's the new picture. Repressor has actually, everything, the amazing thing is, everything I've told you up to now is true. Ah, hasn't lied. But it's just left something out. There's a layer of cooperativity that's superimposed on what we've been talking about that we missed. And that, that, that layer of cooperativity involves this interaction, making an octomer of repressor. Now, what's the effect? I'm going to tell you, by the way, that the strategy is as before. I tell you the answer, and then I'll tell you how we know. The, the effect of this long-range cooperativity is that PL and PR are repressed slightly more efficiently than they otherwise would be. So, for example, in a, in a, uh, uh, without the, the long-range cooperativity, no, without the long-range cooperativity, it's the dashed line, right. With the long-range cooperativity, you get just be slightly better repression. Now, I, it's a little hard to know. This is the repressed concentration in a lysogen. But you see, you were already 99.9 .9 or something here. With this thing, you're up to 99.999. And I don't, you know, there's no, one doesn't know how physiologically important that is. But because, you know, when somebody says the impression, the, the repression is increased tenfold, you have to say tenfold compared to what? So if it's already repressed to the 99% level, if you go to 99.9, .9, that's a factor of 10. Does it matter? So. Anyway, that, 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 this is a calculated curve, but I'll let John worry about that. Okay, but now here's the real deal. Repressor now binds cooperatively to OR3 and OL3. So that now these guys are making an octomer. Now a tetramer binds to OL3 and OR3. And because, you see, and because of this added cooperativity, now occupancy of OR3 is much more efficient than we had thought. And in fact, the way it, it works, so PRM was repressed much more efficiently. So here was the old view that repressor was at 1 and 2, 90% of the time, and here all three sites less than 10%. We now know that it's more like 60 or 70% of the time repressor approximately. Repressor is actually turning itself off. And so the repressor concentration in a lysogen is some three-fold lower than it would otherwise be. So here's what the curve looks like. So here's, here's the concentration of, here's um, expression from PRM in the old scenario. And you see at a lysogen, there's almost no repression. And, and then it starts getting repressed. 
where there's none here, actually. It starts getting repressed. In the new world, with octamerization and tetramerization, repressor is in a lysogen already reduced some, approximately, turns out, threefold from the maximum. So suddenly, we have an answer to two mysteries. One is, why is, what's the point of OL3? And why is repression so inefficient? The answer is, OL3 helps repressor to bind cooperatively to OR3, and that greatly increases the efficiency of negative regulation of PRM, and that, by the way, well, I guess I don't have the slide saying it. I got it later. Say, and the point is that if you don't have this negative regulation of PRM, the concentration of repressor goes up threefold, and now you can't UV induce the cells. So this whole commotion of making this long-range interaction is there for a factor of three, but the factor of three is critical to getting the system to work. Because otherwise, the concentration of repressor is just too high for everything to work the way it's supposed to work when you induce. So that's also a kind of a scary thing, right? Let's say, assume you're studying grown-up cells, and someone tells you a factor of two or three is critical, how are you ever going to figure that out? So, and I just wanted to remind you, and John will maybe say more about this, it, 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 people talk about looping, but they, you know, you can fool yourself into thinking that, ah, oh, there's something about making a loop. The point is that there's a concentration of, repress, of proteins, A and B, at which point they're not bound, if they're separately. If they're together, they bind because they touch one another. That's cooperativity, the park bench, tidal wave idea. But exactly the same reasoning goes into what happens when they're at a distance. The only difference is they touch each other. The only difference is now that you have to pay the price of the looping. So the looping is a consequence of the cooperativity. So it's cooperativity either when they're right next to each other or when they're at a distance. Yeah? Yes. I'm about, I'm about to tell you all that. And I think what you just said is wrong. They're not different. How do we know? Okay. So, so first of all, there's this amazing thing. There was a guy, there's a guy, I shouldn't say a guy, there's a scientist named Sunir, who I never met, who for some years has been publishing papers on lambda repressors saying that actually not only does it form dimers and tetramers, it forms an octamer in vitro, just purified repressor. The way he did this was by a technique called equilibrium sedimentation. So not velocity sedimentation, which is always difficult to analyze. But equilibrium sedimentation is where you centrifuge the thing to equilibrium. And now the width of the band is determined by the diffusion constant, which is related to the size of the, of the glumph. And so if you do this, somehow if you do this, at a lot of different concentrations, and temperature and blah, blah, and then you computer programs, and fancy machines, it's amazing. Somehow, he, he said there was an octomer. So nobody paid any attention to it. I wasn't in the field, so I'm not guilty of that. But most people, I don't think, paid much attention. Because first of all, it's obscure physical chemistry, and who can understand it? And secondly, he deduced that this octomer formed very rarely. There's less than one. If you take the, the energetics of octomer formation and you compare that to the concentration of repressor in a cell, you have less than one octomer per cell. So how could it mean anything? I think that's another reason that nobody paid um, uh, too much attention. But it turns out that, it turns out that, as well as I just told you. So how do we know this is the case? Well, in vitro, uh, an experiment done actually by Benno Mullerhill. We took two lambda operators here, two lambda operators here, separated by 3,000 base pairs, and now got a, a loop in the EM showing that they were interacting. Then the real, there were a couple other things, but the real insight came from Australia, where they, they got some guys named uh, Sherwin, Dodd, and Egan who really take this stuff very seriously and we're about it. And so they repeated this experiment looking at the repression of PR and the, re 
suppression of PRM and activation of PRM and so on. But instead of the, instead of the, the um, reporter having just a single operator, it had the added OL 2,000 base pairs away. Which, by the way, now explains why we never saw it. In other words, we figured out how the whole system works too reductively. Because we eliminated that upstream site. When they added that upstream site, then they got basically this result. That PRM now gets repressed much more quickly than it does in the absence of that upstream site. See? So I said, it's one of these funny things. Could it ever have been figured out if we hadn't gotten rid of one of the operators? My guess is no, but it's a parlor game. On the other hand, when you get rid of one of the operators, you're now open to missing something. So it's just, it just shows you science is hard. <laughs> um, and then in vivo, they, 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 I, I, I adjusted you, but in, I, as I already told you, with that extra operator now, you get slightly more efficient repression of PR, but it's not a very big deal. Okay, so here's the picture again. The octomer forms, and then here, it's a tetramer, and you see what's happened is that the octomer has paid the price the way the way the guys over in the physics building like to talk, has paid the price of looping, right? And now it's very easy for a tetra tetramer to snuggle in there and this guy to help this guy buy. Now, I must admit, looking at that, it seems completely ridiculous, doesn't it? But, you think this, we're just kidding around here. Oh, yes, and this was, this then, of course, is the other thing that, that the Australian showed, that if you mutate either OR3, or OL3, the repressor concentration goes up threefold and you can't induce the lysogen. Completely astonishing thing. And by the way, that's the kind of thing, and you always find guys who say, oh yeah, well I knew that. When I mutated OL3, the thing, I couldn't induce it. But of course, no one would ever talk about that because who, who knows what that means? You know, life is just too complicated, so yeah. Yes. 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 I believe that's true. I believe. I, I'm sh I, I, it must be true, and I think it actually is true. <laughs> because there isn't enough energy of the tetramer alone to do all the huffing and puffing, right? It's actually. A, a, it's, you might even say it's an octamer and two plus two cooperativity, because you need the octamer to, to get this whole thing to to swivel into place, and that makes it much easier for the tetramer to bind. So, uh, isn't there an experiment showing that? You know, Jose? I, I'm pretty sure they have. Anyway, it must be true. But you, you could read Dodd and Egan and the reference in the book, and you could see. It must be true. Yeah? No, because if you mute no, because if you mutate OL three, you get no repression. Right. This is the argument we had about lack. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, it is certainly true. For example, in the Gal case, if you have repressors on either side of an operator and you go like that, you could distort the operator so that now it's harder to read. And I, I just can't remember now whether they, that's what they believe or that's what they don't believe. But it's, it's one or the other. So I guess it could be right. But anyway, it's if I must say, I. I don't want to say those cases aren't clear, but this case is really done to death in the sense that you know the predictions are so incredibly um, compelling. So I just don't know the other cases that well anymore. Uh, now, so one of the reasons we believe all this, by the way, is again a combination of crystallography and genetics, which you're going to see the repressor is quite a busy fellow. It's got a DNA binding domain here. It's got an activating region here. 
It's got a linker with a cleavage site for induction. It's got a dimerization thing, and it's actually got two spots for tetramerization and octamerization. So let me show you what I mean. So here are the amino domains on DNA. This is a pair and so on, and they fit and so on and so forth. And here's an octamer. Slightly, it's a pretty good model actually, based on just the, what's been crystallized is the carboxyl domain. And you can see the carboxyl domain makes an octamer, and then it points toward each of these amino domains. So you can imagine this thing making a, a nice glump. This was the work of um, Mitch Lewis uh, and uh, Anne and so on had something to do with it. So now, how do we know that means anything? Okay, so now let me show you how it works. So th th this now answers Titian's question. So there are three kinds of dots on the carboxyl domain of Lambert Professor. One kind of dot is white, and that's what mediates dimerization. Those are the strongest interactions. That's a homotypic interaction, they call it. Makes dimer and it's done. There are no more sites. But the other two guys come together with dark versus light, dark versus light, and that leaves dark versus light and dark versus light on top, right? So you can make a tetramer. You can also make a tetramer this way. Or you can make an octamer, and now notice you've stopped. So you can make a dimer. So, so using these contacts, you make a tetramer or an octamer, and then you stop, right? Now, this is the kind of thing, you know, if you're a professional crystallographer, you, you have no idea what I had to do to these guys to, 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 to let me draw this picture, because there's always something that they'll tell you. Ah, there's an angstrom here. Mm -hmm. But this is basically right. So, um, and so that corresponds to this thing. Now, the contacts between, this is designed to show you two of the octamerization or tetramerization. Remember, the tetramerization and octamerization contacts are the same, right? So you look at one of those interfaces, and if you actually go through this spaghetti and so on, you see there are just like four or five amino acids. It's a very weak, very small region, giving low energy, but you know, added up eight times or whatever over the course of the, or 16 times over the course of the various interactions. How do we know that those things mean anything? So you see this is an argument you can have with a crystallographer. He shows you something, you say, well, how do you know? I mean, there are crystal packing forces, all kinds of things. How do you know those interactions mean anything? So in a, again, an amazing experiment done years ago by Anne Hochschild gave us mutants we didn't know at the time, but which turned out to be mutations in these cooperativity regions. So first of all, let, let's go back. First of all, we need dimerization mutants. Well, those are easy. I think actually Bob Sauer, I said a lot of those. They just induce at low doses of UV light um, because it turns out that the cleavage reaction goes better with monomers than with dimers, something that's been known. So if you just get things that don't dimerize as well, then it's easier to cleave them. That's the idea. So it's easy to get dimerization mutants. And they map, that's completely straightforward. They map exactly where the dimerization uh, region is. Now, what about the dimer-dimer interaction mutants, the ones we sometimes call cooperativity mutants? So now you've got to pay attention. This is totally counterintuitive here. So remember how two repressor dimers bind cooperatively side by side. Well, and some years ago showed that they also bind cooperatively when they're separated by, say, 10 turns of the helix. And there's a little loop, and that was the first indication we ever had that there was loop, could be looping. And John's recent work tells us that it's much easier to do this kind of bending than we ever would have thought. So anyway, that works. You can show that in a footprint experiment, this site will make it much easier to bind to this site and vice versa. So they're binding cooperatively. Now there's a funny effect of that cooperativity in vivo. So in vivo, this guy helps this guy, and this guy now turns on polymerase. Right? But if this guy is moved up 10 turns to the helix, for some reason now, that interaction distorts this just enough so that it no longer activates. If you took this away and just have a, a, a strong OR2 site so it binds on its own, it activates fine. So it's an amazing effect. You add a binding site upstream and activation goes away. So you pick mutants in which activation is restored. And they turn out to be mutants and things that can't interact. Can't make that was the idea. And it turns out, it turns out that those mutants are exactly, exactly these guys. Every one of these sites is a site of one of man's mutants.
So in other words, the mutants that prevent interaction between dimers in, on DNA in vivo are precisely the ones that lie in precisely the surface that mediates octomer formation in vitro and by the crystallization. That's really good stuff. Finally, gene activation. So now this, you remember I, I told you that genes and signals is a footnote to the genetic switch. And that's because the genetic switch um, uh, cannot, finally can lay out in the absolutely clearest terms, I guess you might say, the mechanism of gene activation. And that turns out, there, there's sort of an irony of, of all this, let me just say. I might have said this when I started. So Jacob and Minot, and all their genius and so on, they described a world that was ruled by repressors. And in fact, Minot resisted the idea that there could be activators. But it turns out that it's more revealing to think about activators. I hope this becomes clear. And in fact, uh, because the world is run by this mechanism called recruitment, almost all, all genes that we know about, with the exception of certain phage genes, are subject to both activation and repression. If that's obscure, it becomes clear, I think, in a minute. So that's why this is really important to uh, thrash our way through here. So we say that repressor activates, and you can call it, we call it recruitment. Every word has a problem, but that's one word. It's a kind of cooperative binding. There's always a complication with that term. Um, but at any rate, it's a simple adhesive reaction, interaction, between the repressor and the polymerase. And I'll try to explain why it was so hard for people to accept that, and for all I know, even now, some people in alleys and stuff, bad mouth it, but you never know. So what do we mean by that? That it works by, by recruitment, and how do we know that it's right? OK, so first of all, repressor snuggle, when repressor's on DNA, it snuggles right up to polymerase. How do we, we knew that years ago. How do we know that? Well, there, uh, Wally Gilbert in, invented these chemical probes that led to his sequencing method that some of you might or might not know. But anyway, one of the side things was something called ethyl, what is it? Ethyl Phosphorylurea, something. So anyway, you, if you ethylate certain phosphates, polymerase can't bind, and then certain other phosphates, repressor can't bind, something you can detect in a, uh, uh, by, by binding and then, by, by modifying binding and then cutting where the modification is. And the point is that repressor, there's one phosphate that will affect the binding of both polymerase and repressor which means that the two must come very close to one another. That was the origin of the technical term snuggle. The second insight came from Lenny Granti, who showed that DNA binding and activation are separable functions in the sense that you can eliminate one activation without eliminating the other. So he picked mutants called positive control mutants. They bind DNA normally, but they don't activate. And you see why this immediately clarifies your thinking. Because otherwise, you're stuck with the idea that somehow the mechanism of DNA binding has something to do with activation, but doesn't. You can, you can separate the two. And that's why it's important to add, but by the way, repressor doesn't change the pitch of the helix, doesn't do anything to DNA, so it's a silly idea anyway. But since we're arguing about 10, you know, by about one or two kilocalories of activation energy, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a whole thing. So anyway, if you're interested, here's how Lenny did this experiment. He simply picked mutants. He had a plasmid-making repressor, and he picked mutants that are immune to lambda so they can bind DNA. But unlike the wild type, which can turn on this prm lax z fusion and make the cells red, this one can't. So the cells are white. So you look for white cells that are immune. And he found all these PC mutants. And amazingly enough, coincidentally, actually, they lie along the outside of the helix turn helix motif. Here's helix two, and also in the bend here between two and three. There's no reason why they had to be there, but, or, but anyway, in lambda they are. 
Then it was possible to show that lambda doesn't work optimally in this, re I mean maximally in this regard. Rick Bushman made a bunch of substitutions and you can make guys who activate, whereas the wild type might activate sevenfold, you can get guys that activate fourfold better. And usually what you're doing is leaving the glue, and this is important, 34, and the ASP 38, and then changing some of these other guys, and you can get things that work better and better. So it's obviously something about the outside surface of that helix, and in the bend, in the, this helix, the outside of this helix that's doing the activating. And there's nothing, and a, a lot of, oh, and by the way, a lot of different sequences work. And by the way, they tend to be acidic, which might be. And then it turns out that, it turns out that, ah, sorry, it turns out that this, where this shared phosphate is, is exactly where model building shows that alpha helix should lie from lambda repressor. So it's, in other words, it's very likely that lambda repressor is just contacting polymerase with this surface to do this activation. Crystallography. So now here's a structure again from, uh, from Seth Darst. And again, I think it's deep, deep. And so here are two lambda repressor amino domains. And here is a RNA polymerase. Now, it's put together from bits and so on, which you could read about. But the amazing thing is that, first of all, you see a contact between, you see contacts between repressors activating region and region and sigma, and in particular, a part of sigma called region four. Nobody changes structure. Nobody, there's no fancy allosteric. It's just these things look the same whether they're touching one another or not. And if you now, now remember I told you you could, you could get PC mutants, you could also get suppressors of PC mutants, which are mutants in the polymerase, which now can use a mutant repressor and be activated by it. So you've replaced one interaction with another, and the repressor position is ASP38. Remember that's that ASP that was it. And in polymerase, it's ARG596, and it turns out that that's exactly it's exactly, S38 and RH596 is exactly where the crystallography says there's an interaction. So the genetics and the crystallography say that the surfaces that mediate cooperativity are just like the surfaces that mediate gene activation. In both cases, they're small, they're just a few residues, and in both cases, the genetics strongly supports that the interaction that's seen, which otherwise would be so weak you might not believe it, is real. So is that clear? The activating region is transferable. So for example, crow, which ordinarily doesn't activate, even if it's just sitting on site two, which you can arrange, can be turned into an activator by changing the residues along the outside of this helix in this position to look like lambda repressor. And now it activates when you stick it on site two. So, so in other words, crow ordinarily is binding to site two and site three. If you bind it just to site two, it doesn't activate. But it turns out the reason it doesn't activate has nothing to do with its DNA binding. It's just because it lacks the residues along that outside surface. And finally, this whole series of experiments that Ann did, which first done in yeast actually, which show that they're called activator bypass experiments because you, you, as, as you'll see, you see high levels of what you would call activation mediated in the absence of an activator simply by direct recruitment, which shows that recruitment suffices. And so you see, you start to worry about the word activation because neither the gene nor the enzyme is activated. All that happens is they're brought together. So let's see. So here's polymerase, and remember it's using it's got a helix turn helix binding to minus 35. It's got something binding to minus 10. This thing at strong promoters can bind to an up element. So, um, so maybe I should just go back one step. So, so when, when lambda repressor binds, it contacts right here on sigma, and that makes this go at 10 to 50 fold higher level. 
So another way to do it is to take a completely heterologous protein, which has a DNA binding domain and something Y, and then stick something you know it interacts with onto polymerase in the place of the carboxyl domain of alpha, and now you've got a completely heterologous protein-protein interaction, and that turns this gene on like gangbusters. So there's nothing special about how the activator touches the protein. And in fact, if you look at lots of different activators from E. coli, they touch the polymerase in lots of different places. It's just a question of binding energy and being consistent with the geometry. Activation turns out, it's a very fraught subject, turns out to be the world's simplest thing. An example of the same kinds of interactions as you see with cooperative binding between proteins. You just have to touch. Another example here is where you take CAP, which is the activator of the LAC genes, and you fuse it directly to polymerase, put a CAP site here, and now this works at a very high level in front of PRM. So that tells you that all you have to do is bring the polymerase to the DNA. Uh, <laughs> another version of this is Anne's caboose experiment, because so, so this would really, if you want to say, as people do want to say, that the interaction between the activating region and sigma does something special, there's some kind of an allosteric change and so on and so forth. This, I think, puts all this way of thinking to rest because what she did was to stick sigma, part of sigma, just duplicated it, stuck it out here. Now, repressor moved upstream so that it can just touch this part of sigma, activates. So it's just a question of providing binding energy. And of course, that's just, as you know from polymerase, you can have a good minus 10, not so good minus 35. You can get the same amount of transcription if you have a bad minus 10, but a very good up element if this is the, the ordinary thing. You can do it with this kind of, it's just a question of getting the total energy such that you get the thing there. Now then there are some fancier things because polymerase has to melt the DNA and so on and so forth. But, um, but to go back to one of the early things we said, the regulation is separate from the enzymology. The, dis the, the, the discussion of how RNA polymerase actually opens the DNA and begins to transcribe is infinitely Talmudic and to some people very interesting and important. That's not the same as the question is how it's regulated. The regulation simply tells you where it happens and with what frequency. And it turns out that you see from all this that all you have to do is touch it and get it there by this phenomenon of this thing. A predicted property of this idea of how you activate is that things will, different activators will work synergistically. So for example, if lambda repressor is touching sigma and cap is touching the alpha domain, the carboxyl terminal domain of alpha, these two things should work synergistically, that is to say, greater than the sum of either one working separately. The way to think about it is, it's a binding problem. So if you have a certain number of kilocalories here and a certain number of kilocalories here, you add the kilocalories so it's e to the kilocalories. So you get a synergistic effect. And this is actually right. And of course, this is the hallmark of how eukaryotic activators work. Uh, I'm going to skip this because we can come back to this. Now, I, what I'm about to say I think is important because it, it clarifies everything I just said. Because otherwise you might think, well, yeah, that was perfectly obvious. Why would anyone even discuss this? Or, or, on the other hand, you might get into detailed arguments about the exact pathway by which all this stuff that I'm talking about happens. But what I mean to say is, contrast how lambda repressor works with another case, which is discussed in genes and signals, that you find in bacteria, which we call real activation polymerase activation. So first you just have to know, as I think I mentioned, you can swap sigmas in E. coli. So you can have a different sigma than, this is the one that, that the genes we've been talking about are read uh, by, sig which contains sigma 70. There is also a form that contains sigma 54. Sigma 54 recognizes genes such as glin A. Ah, yes, John, I wanted to ask you about this. So now, the amazing thing is, if you look inside the cell, you find RNA polymerase sitting on that gene. 
like a rock. It is, in, it is sitting there and it is inactive. And so what does the activator do? The activator binds upstream and touches this, but now it, touch, it doesn't just touch it. It actually uses ATP to induce a conformational change here. It may not be such a big deal, there's a flap and so on and so forth, but this is a real activation of that otherwise inert polymerase. So the point is that thing, John, that thing found its site without any help, and that's, I don't know if that's an issue. So, so recruitment says it's the dumbest possible model. You just, you, you have a bit of glue and you bring the polymerase to the gene, then it works. Now there's a fancier way nature does it, does it too, which is to have the polymerase sitting there and now have an activator that when it's turned on actually goes and does some enzymatic reaction and turns the thing on. And it's the distinction between these two that we're trying to make clear. And one of the reasons we make this distinction is that if we get to it or if you look at genes and signals, you'll see that a huge amount of regulatory stuff, particular transcription, but other fields as well, other areas as well, works by recruitment and not by this mechanism. That's why it's quite important to understand this as the contrasting case. So here are some of the considerations. When you have the case I just described where the polymerase gets activated, you don't actually absolutely require DNA binding of the activator. Whereas in regulated recruitment, you absolutely must have DNA binding. So for example, if you overproduce the activator, so that it can't bind to DNA. I'm sorry, overproduce an activator that can't bind to DNA, but make it at large amounts, it will still come and um, goose is the word, this polymerase, and render it active. So high concentrations of an activator will work on a polymerase activated system. It will not work, it will not work in a recruitment case, right? If you express lambda repressor at infinitely high concentrations. If it can't bind DNA, it will never activate the gene because the way it works is by bringing the thing to the gene, just like in the two hybrid system that you're probably familiar with. I'll tell you why I'm telling you this in a minute. In the case of polymerase activation, there are no repressors. In regulated recruitment, there are activators and repressors. In this case, there are only activators. Why? Because, because when the polymerase is sitting there, and it needs energy to be turned on, there's no need for a repressor. It's all done. I mean, why, if you were to build the world in the first place, why, if somebody just goes around saying, oh, genes are turned on and off, well, that's funny. Why not just turn them on <laughs> and leave them off as the ground state? Well, the answer is that if you're doing it by recruitment, there's inevitably a background, and that background is always subject to repression. Whereas if you're doing it by real enzymatic activation, you don't need repressors. So if Jacobin and Minot had studied this case, they never would have thought of repressors in the first place. Whereas in the recruitment type cases, for example, here are the lac genes, without any activator, which happens to be under these circumstances, the polymerase has a certain frequency with which it binds and transcribes the gene. That's called the basal level. That's true of all genes in eukaryotes that we know of and many, many genes in bacteria. You can then help it by adding an activator, in this case cap, it could have been lambda repressor. And then you can repress that basal level by putting in a repressor, which will actually also prevent the activator from working. Another difference is that in the polymerase active, and maybe this is why eukaryotes use the recruitment mechanism. In the case of polymerase activation, there's no synergistic activation. In the case of regulated recruitment, there is. Because in the regulated recruitment thing, as I've said, if you just, in the simplified case, just touch any, any two places, you're gonna to tend to work synergistically. But in the case where you're literally activating the enzyme, there's only one place to activate it, to stick the key in and turn the lock. And so you're much more restricted in the way you can integrate signals, do you see what I mean? And use them in combinations. Now, you don't have to believe me, by the way, that, that this is how it works in eukaryotes. That's, uh, I'll give you some of that argument uh, next time after John talks, um, or you could look in the book. But that's the point. That's one of the points of the 
Do you want to hang on for another five minutes and I'll tell you just a couple of other things? Do you want to ask any questions? Do you want to go to sleep? Do you want to wake up? Yeah. Yeah. What about the, you're talking in terms of the equilibrium process, right? Yeah. What about them? Uh, I mean, what's like better tool that they enhance the on rate or decrease the off rate? It, uh, that's exactly what John's going to talk about. All right. Okay. But don't, the, the different, I'll just give you this one thing to say. Whereas cooperativity between two lambda repressors uh, will increase, let's see, I guess in theory it would increase the off rate, not the on rate so much. Because you still have to bind, right, in the right orientation. But, in the, but still, it's an equilibrium sort of thing. Whereas in the polymerase case, as John will say, there's an equilibrium at first, but then you hold the polymerase for a little bit, and boom, it goes into this open conformation, and now it's stuck there forever. It never dissociates. So it goes from equilibrium to non-equilibrium, hence this fancy word quasi-equilibrium. I just wanted to, yeah, sure. Okay, that's, that, that's what John will talk about. Let's just say there is a chance. <laughs> what it is exactly, I don't know. Uh, okay, just so you know, because I mean, geez. It turns out that, 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 you know, we've been saying that repressor, act, that, that you get activation by elimination of cooperativity because uh, Reque cleaves repressor. Well, it turns out that repressor, act, that it's a funny thing. The active site for the cleavage is actually in the repressor amino domain itself. Rec A doesn't, isn't a typical protease. But you need Rec A, this protein, which gets activated when it sees damaged DNA, to interact with the repressor, and then repressor cleaves itself. You can also get repressor to cleave itself just by raising the pH. And um, these are structures solved by John Little. And you can see that the linker is not the way we've drawn it in the books. It actually looks more like real science now. And the, he's got actually, there are actually two forms, one in which it's like this and one in which it's like this. In this case, there's an active serine right here in the carboxyl domain, which when it's com either at high pH or when it's complexed with repressor, uh, or, or when it's complex complexed with Rec A, will cause cleavage. So it's just a, I'm not quite sure, so sure why the carboxyl domain is so much bigger than the amino domain, but it probably right. Anyway, so those pictures, so, so there you see an example of how all the pictures in the genetics which are wrong in the sense that the linker doesn't, doesn't look quite look like a dumbbell. It looks a little more like this. If you actually look at the structure, it looks like a mess, but that's something else. Ah, now this, I don't want to get into this right now. Uh, it's really interesting, but it's just too, uh, yeah, I just want to tell you about this because these are, uh, experiments that John Little has been doing, which are really quite, uh, really interesting. Y you want to know how, uh, you want to know how the switch could have evolved. And I'll just say that when you look at other phages, although I don't think anyone's gone back and re-looked at this, and probably now is a very good time to look, that you find that many of these principles of the switch are exactly the same in P22 and 434. At three sites, on, off, blah, blah, blah. But the actual geometries are quite different in the different cases. Exactly where the polymerase touches the repressor and so on and so forth. But the patterns seem to have been selected or maintained as they divergently evolve. But what John does take a different approach, which is to ask what happens if you degrade the things we think are, are central to the switch? So for example, if you change OR1 to OR3, so now you get a f the famous phage called 323, where it's OR3 or two or three, what does that phage do? And it does lysogenize, it does grow lytically, and that's after all what evolution is trying to select. It just doesn't do it as well. It lysogenizes half as well, it leaks phages, which is what you might expect because you probably have more alternate pairwise cooperativity, so the level of repressor is lower. It doesn't, it induces at low doses. There are various things wrong with it. So if you look at the, at, at the book, you see that there are, Two or three cases where he's eliminated positive controls. And the, the general answer is that when you do these things, you, you can take either view. You can either say, well, the switch is surprisingly robust to these changes, 
in the sense that you still get lysogens, you still get lytic growth, or you could take the view that, well, it's just what you might expect. It works, but it doesn't work as well. It's as though, but the nice thing is, it's as though evolution made selections in steps. So it could have gone through intermediate phases. It's probably not a case of intelligent design. <laughs> right. um, yes, I was going to tell you what was wrong with Lambda 323. And then, just as a parlor game, you, know, you, you can see now that since the whole switch is just based on these very simple kinds of binding interactions, once you've got a polymerase and a promoter, well, first of all, you could have, you might have in the original case, have a repressor bind that turns off the lytic genes. And this will work to a certain level, certain basal level, right? And so you'd have some repressor. It would just not be very stable. You might move that site over. That's not hard to do. Now this thing would activate this as it repressed that. And now you can do most of what you need to do. Now you can add another one here, which will add a certain degree of cooperativity to the thing and make it more efficient. Um, now you could make this gene crow, which is going to come back and turn this off and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's just this highly complicated machine is just built of these little pieces that are easily maneuvered around and easily made to interact with one another. This, of course, doesn't include the long range interaction, which would make it a little better. Every one of these steps just improves the biological function, but doesn't they're not all required for the biological function. And that's the point. OK, 2 o'clock. So, um, so we'll start next time with John doing this, the physical modeling. And then whatever time's left, I'll say a few words about the other stuff. And um, we'll be around if you, anybody wants to discuss things Tuesday afterward. There's a little room nearby we could go to. John left some references that just in case you want them. And Thursday, we, you know, I don't know. If any, if any of you want to come, we'll do it Thursday. But if not, we won't. Yeah. express the carboxyl domain it is a it is a dominant negative just as if if you overexpress the amino domain uh, right whether the experiments have actually been done I don't know but it must be true <laughs> yes Sure.